So good morning and welcome to Leaders Up Close. This is a program uh, run by UCF's Engineering Leadership and Innovation Institute. We thank Duke Energy for sponsoring this series uh, for us. Today it's my privilege and honor to introduce to you Colonel Fries, who's going to share his view about leadership. Part of it comes from his experience as an aerospace engineer, graduate of University of Colorado. Uh, we were sharing stories earlier. He has a lot of space experience, and I do a lot of space work, so that's kind of cool. Uh, we thank him for coming to share his story. I'm not going to give you any more background. He was sharing his stories along the way, and I think we'll learn a whole bunch, be entertained a little bit, and also give us a view on leadership from a military perspective. And I know those folks do leadership really well. We appreciate all the service the military does for us. So without further ado, Colonel Fries. I haven't talked yet, so we'll see how I can clap afterwards. OK, well, good morning. So a guy standing up here in uniform, I'm going to tell you something about leadership. And I think you probably understand that the military pushes leadership uh, very hard. It's at the core of everything we do. And unlike a lot of companies, uh, it's one thing that will push their officers throughout their entire career. So I have several things to say to you today. I can, I'll, I'm going to give you my, uh, my background, my personal thoughts on leadership based on my experiences. And I certainly can jump in and talk about leadership anytime because I love it. I love talking about leadership and the challenges. It's one of the things that I'm passionate about, things that I, you, you wake, wants to wake me up every day and talk about leadership. Um, and, I, and I'll talk to you about how I got to that. Because I didn't always start being passionate about leadership. I sort of found that out uh, as I entered the, the U.S. military uh, and, and through ROTC. So a little bit about myself. Uh, grew up in Illinois, moved to Colorado, Boulder, Colorado. Attended the University of Colorado. Uh, started, studied aerospace engineering because I've been a space guy at heart since I was a kid. Astronauts, rocketry. Aliens. If it was about space, I was watching Marvin the Martians. It was one of my favorite characters, you know, along with, along with uh, Bugs Bunny. So I am a space guy through and through. And so I wanted the opportunity to work in space. I have really bad eyes. So I don't, I don't wear glasses because they're about the size of a Coke bottle. I wear contact lenses, right? So I wasn't going to be an astronaut. I knew that pretty early on. But I really want to be involved in space. So I worked uh, to find what I wanted to do. I had some teachers who said, who told me about engineering and what it was, and I said, wow, that sounds like what I want to do. I want to design rockets. I want to be there when they take off. I don't work with satellites. And so how do I get to do that job? And that was aerospace engineering. Hunted around for some colleges, got accepted to uh, Iowa State University and University of Colorado. Did a campus tour of both of them. I happened to get to the University of Colorado on the Friday before Easter break, and there was a bunch of students putting their skis in the car, putting the beer in the car, because you could drink when you're 18 at the time. The snow was coming down. Everybody's having a good time leaving. I said, I don't even need to talk to the engineering dean, because I'm going here. So uh, it was a good choice. So I went to the University of Colorado, uh, four years, went through the ROTC program, uh, because I had, had grown up in an organization called Civil Air Patrol, which is a search and rescue Air Force Auxiliary as a, as a high school student. Uh, they taught me how to fly. I had my pilot's license when I was 17. And so it was a ni nice fit for me. So I did one year in ROTC, not on a scholarship, kind of a try before you buy. I really liked it, liked the friends I was making. And then they offered me a three-year scholarship, liked it even better. So I was able to pay through the rest of school and then enter the United States military. So in 1987, I was commissioned. There's a slight delay from commissioning entry. In 88, I entered active duty as an aerospace engineer. Actually, my title was astronautical engineer because you had to pick one or the other, astro or aero. So I was an astronautical engineer, and I went to Cape Canaveral. And my job was to launch the first GPS spacecraft. And I can tell you at the time that GPS was kind of the low man on the totem pole because all the Titan rockets there were launching all the cool secret rockets. They were big, and the satellites were expensive, and they did amazing things. And the GPS is just a navigation beacon. And we still have maps, and we still have TACAN and LORAN. This is a waste of time. And this is never going to take off, right? So, Amazing how things changed and how innovative people and engineers figure out new ways to use the GPS signal and transform society. You probably couldn't imagine life today without a navigation beacon of some sort, the space based. Okay? So I worked down there, and I can tell you one of the first things that I learned as an engineer 
As I showed up at Cape Canaveral, there really wasn't a training program for engineers. They expect you to know engineering, and they dropped out. And our job essentially was quality assurance or oversight of the contractor, McDonnell Douglas, who was constructing the Delta II rocket on the launch pad and launching them. So we would watch them do things. And when they deviated from a drawing, because you know, you've got thousands and thousands of parts and not everything goes together perfectly, uh, but there's some sort of issue, and they'll deviate from the process and then they'll want to get U.S. government buy-in that what they're doing is an acceptable practice because our $65 million satellite is sitting on top of that. And so we'd, we'd, I'd watch their work. When I learned about rocketry is that I knew how a rocket worked. I knew why the parts were important. Uh, and I knew the importance of guidance and, and debris control and you know, when, you, when the fairing comes off, you don't want to hit the satellite. I knew all those things. But building a rocket was really plumbers and pipe fitters. When somebody asks, well, how tight do you tighten that nut for the pneumatic line? Heck, I don't know. You know? Or how to secure a wire harness properly so it doesn't break. How to run things, you know, what the minimum turn radius or maximum turn radius, depending on what you're working for things are. There was a lot of trade craft in making a rocket. So what I learned is that when you design something, somebody's got to build it. Real human beings have to build it. And so if you design something that they can't build, that's a problem, right? So I didn't know a lot about, uh, you know, you, you've, sometimes you've got to get your hand in there or a tool in there to turn something, put something, to make it work. Or when things go wrong, you've got to test it somehow. So think about if you're designing something and making it work, how, are, how is somebody going to build it? How is somebody going to test it, uh, uh, conduct some analysis, um, and work on it afterwards. That was one of the things I learned because the folks building the rocket were plumbers and pipe fitters, electricians, hydraulics. There was one or two engineers on the pad going through the procedure, right? But the large part was that the guys that, you know, the same guy you would pay 100 bucks an hour to come work on your, your, uh, your bathroom system and your sink or build your house, they're building that rocket because they know how to use those tools properly, know how, to, how, to, how the lines go in and whatnot. So they're just following the process. Now, when things didn't fit and we had to decide, you know, how to all right, make that, that's when the engineers get involved. So I, I did learn a little bit of that. And I was working alongside uh, NASA engineers. People worked at NASA. Some guy literally had bolted uh, 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 Alan Shepard into the Mercury capsule. I mean, there was a lot, of guy, a lot of heritage right there. And it was exciting to work with those guys. And they're all in their late 60s at that point. Uh, I was born after, you know, they had done a lot of this great work. And so talking to them and their experiences, I learned a lot about um, responding to failure, adapting to problems on the launch pad, and building a rocket. And when they kind of came, it was uh, February 14th of 1990, was the launch of the first Delta II rocket that we have been working on. And uh, they pulled the launch pad uh, gantry away from the rocket, and, uh, and we hadn't, hadn't fueled the, uh, the first stage up uh, with, with liquid oxygen yet, so you can go out to the pad and you could uh, look at the rocket, and you could actually be on the, the pad. And I remember staying there on this pad with this giant rocket, and, uh, and we're just sort of going back and feeling ready to go. And I had this impending feeling like, as a kid, we used to build these Rube Goldberg contraptions to try and do something and that and this. And I thought, this is never going to work. You know, because it all has to work perfect, first time, right? And I looked at this thing, and I thought, I understood the complexity of a, actually a fairly simple rocket. And I looked at this and I thought, well, we've done our best to make this work. And, uh, uh, and I just looked at this machine. And then we went back in the blockhouse, we filled it up, and the rocket took off. And um, it's amazing to watch that machine you work, what you've worked on, and boom, that satellite's going 17,000 miles an hour off into orbit, heading off to, to medium altitude orbit. So uh, that was a success. We had. Uh, um, 24 straight successes in rocket launches when I was there. I had no failures when I was there. One did occur later on after I left, and there's a lot of learning going on in that. Um, but it was an exciting time for me. And as a young engineer, I learned a lot about starting as an individual engineer and being good at what I did and developing myself, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. And then from that job as I moved in the Air Force, because the Air Force doesn't want to make you a great engineer. They want to make you a leader. So, I got on that leadership track and I really enjoyed that because my next job would take me out where I was in command of a small group and they had weapons. Uh, we traveled around, the area, so I had to learn about that, the different uh, uh, career fields, different ages, and I really liked the leadership end of that. So still a space guy at heart, moved on to another space, space unit and uh, began to develop leadership skills. So I took that off. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how 
leadership comes into play. And I would expect that many of you as, as the engineers, you enter the, the engineering career field, there's some things to do right away. Pay attention, develop yourself, develop your competence, and then work on your ability to lead. Because at some point, you might want to run uh, some entrepreneurial company, maybe you want to run Lockheed Martin, you want to say, have your own say, or you found that one idea and you've got to develop into a business that produces value and brings in excellent people. Okay, so that requires leadership. So think about that, think about the things you have to say to you. Um, I had a lot of uh, uh, experience in the Air Force and I've transitioned from, from space operations. I went off to uh, uh, work on the command of air operations. Uh, I've got a chance to work with the most advanced satellites that the United States produces. Um, there's some things out that, one of the good things about being in the military is that uh, you'll get assigned to work on some projects that, are, that really represent the most technologically advanced and capabilities of the nation. And so one of you ask, well, how do they do that? You know, I got a chance to walk into things and go, how do they do that, right? So, uh, and then you talk to some engineers, sometimes not much older than yourself, well, we figured out how to do this. And we've made an application to do that. Uh, and, been able to enable some uh, capabilities that we do. So um, it's been an exciting ride for me. It allows, it's kind of satisfied the inner geek in me at times. But at the end of the day, what I love doing is motivating people to accomplish a task. And so we're going to talk about building leadership. I talk about my cadets. I always ask them with the cadets uh, in ROTC, so are leaders built or are they born? Uh, most of them say built, a couple say born. And I say, well, I hope they're built because otherwise I'm wasting my time, right? So. Their leaders are built, and I believe, I believe that from the heart. So I've got a, a, a few slides here. We'll walk through some, and I want to talk about building leadership. Okay. I want to start off with uh, leadership types, and I think this, is, this sums up my analysis of the people that I've met throughout an entire career in the Air Force. I've been in the Air Force about um, 27 years coming on, and I'm going to retire this summer, and it's been a great time. And I can't, it's been a great time to come back to ROTC as my final job to communicate uh, your experience back to the cr folks, motivate them there in the Air Force, and they're so excited to be a part of the Air Force. But I'm talking to engineers, so I gotta use a graph, right? Everybody's familiar with the XY graph. All right, I'm talking a couple of things. First, I'll talk about competence, and I'll talk about character. These two words sum up, I think, all of the information that you need to know, your described leaders, where it's in, it's in one of these two bins. And you have character. Right now, sitting in your seats, you have character. And I'll bet a lot of it's discipline, integrity, because engineering is hard stuff. And you've got some competence. You might be innately talented, or you're a hard worker. You're developing competence in engineering. So some of this is already in your kit bag today. All right? You didn't get into the school because you were lazy, because you didn't take the time to do the extra homework, because you were uninterested. Okay? You got in because you have some character in you that it's already expressing itself as a hard worker, smart, good ideas, innovative, are already in your character and your competence bag. But as your time, you're going to develop from probably this, uh, probably none of you are sitting at this, 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 this uh, uh, vertex here, but all the way out someplace, you're trying to get, you're trying to develop yourself, and it's a process of continuous learning. So, all right, so the four leadership types. Right at the bottom, who might be this right here? I call this the despot. No confidence in leadership at all, or in anything, and they really have bad character. North Korea comes to mind, okay? Uh, Saddam Hussein, maybe Muammar Gaddafi, a couple folks. Some folks who were born into their position or got to the position on the other side of a gun, all right? Don't have a care for the people. Doesn't matter if the nation sustains itself behind, beyond them. They might say things that are different, but in the end, they only really care about taking care of this person, right? They're a despot. Nobody wants to work for this person because they really can't do anything, and they're usually violent, angry people, all right? Office candy. This person has no competence, but looks really good, all right? Maybe fits the mole, fits, fits your preconceptions of what should be in the office, but doesn't really get the job done. A lot of character, honest, enterprising, but doesn't really produce any results. So you might be an outstanding individual, but if I start, hired you to be an engineer, but you studied something in liberal arts, I don't care how 
much integrity or discipline you have, you're probably not going to be a pretty good engineer, right? And so this is a difficult leader because they don't really have the, the competence to do the job, and it shows through. Initially, there's a facade. Looks great, right? Smart. Everybody likes them. But in the end, they don't produce. So this person is office candy, okay? And you as a manager might have to make a decision, I need to get rid of office candy. As nice as this person is, you know, Winston Churchill used to say, you know, um, a beautiful strategy is great, but every now and then you need to check the results. Okay, so watch out for this. All right. Person who's got a lot of competence, and I'll tell you, the military is all about, all about competence. And why? It's because second place finish usually means a life of servitude for you and your family, right? So uh, failure is not tolerated very well in the military. There's no, there's no prizes for second place. So we're all about competence. And when the nation's at stake, the men's and women's their lives are on the line, you don't want to tell somebody, well, you know, I'm not very competent when I do. I'm a nice guy, but I'm not very competent. And so the military values supreme competence in, in what we do. And you want to follow someone who's competent. Because if you're starving, the farmer is the person you want to follow, right? If you're blind, the one guy in the group who can see. So you will tolerate bad character if you think hooking yourself up to this person is going to help you survive, move up in the world, your company excel. But the problem is hanging out with somebody who's got bad character, even as good as they might be, is they're an ass, OK? And that really wears on you over a long period of time. The person who is, has no character is angry. And they might be great, but it's soul sucking for you and the organization. And people leave. Eventually they say, there ain't no success worth this. And they leave. And they seek out other places. And then the organization doesn't attract good people anymore. And then it begins to take on that personality. In the military, we've been to call these folks recently toxic leaders has come out recently as a, a term for a toxic leader. They might be very, very competent in what they do, but they're toxic. And in the military, we do a lot of, well, suck it up. That guy's really good. You're not hard enough, All right? And we, we push people to the limits. And we've got to do some pretty scary things at times. And you definitely want someone who's competent telling you what to, what to do. They've demonstrated competence, so you feel good like oh, I'm getting told the right things to do. But after a while, man, that wears on you. And so we are addressing toxic leaders. Because after a while of not focusing on character, those folks begin to rule the day. And then when the need to fin win the battle goes away, guess where all of our talent goes? <laughs> Gone. They're going to find someplace else. All right? So much, a lot of folks innate desire to serve keeps them in the military working for toxic leaders. But when they don't perceive the threat or I'm done with my service, all that talent leaves. We have got to stop producing toxic leaders. And a lot of the services are addressing that. So what I want to get you to be is that inspirational leader, the one who's competent and the one you'll follow through thick and thin. When they take a risk and they say it's time to take a risk, you'll know I'm going with this person because that person is smart, they're scanning, they care about me, they're not going to make stupid risks with my life in this company, and there's a lot of success at the end of that. So I want you to be an inspirational leader. So we're going to talk about competence and character to build the inspirational leadership. And I would guess that some of you are Somewhere in the middle of this chart, I hope none of you are hanging under my desk, but down here, unless you're independently wealthy and moving back to some country, that you're ready to go. But you're right down here. So how do I move out this way? And it's a life of continuous development. You're already on the track because you're here. And you want to learn about lead leading, right? You're in this class. How do I be a good leader when I come out? Competence. That's what you're developing right now, your ability. You might be talented. I always hated those guys in engineering that never seem to study and a 3.8 you know, GPI said, I've never seen you open a book. And they just they had photographic memories. They just got it first time around. They understood the language that the instructor was sort of speaking in. It was kind of sounded like English, you know. So <laughs> you, I can relate, right? You know, I've, you know, professors that not on one of them was an Anglo-Saxon name and, and had to work 
pay attention to what they were doing. But they were really smart, and I learned from those, those professors. And I learned from the folks that are out there, but there were people like me, and people that were much, much smarter than me, okay? A lot of us are just knocking it out, developing our capability to be an engineer. So you might be talented. Now this applies to football. You might be a great football player. You've got to practice. Michael Jordan in basketball would tell you that he had to work all the time to be as good as he was. There's no success without hard work developing your ability. Recognize what you want to do and develop it. Whether it's an innate talent, a skill, you know, you're, you're genetically freakishly strong and you're just Arnold Schwarzenegger, that was his thing, he developed it, okay? So work your ability, develop your confidence because people are gonna hire you to be an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, industrial engineer, you pick it. And they expect you to know your stuff. So be good at it, learn it, okay? Develop some competence in followership. It's very unlikely that any of you are gonna step from this job and be the leader. You're gonna be on a team. You're gonna be one engineer and you're gonna meet with other folks and you're developing. So developing followership school skills. So at the core basis of this is be on time, okay? Be prepared for the meeting you're gonna be in. Have you studied what you need to know? Have you understood the background of what, you, what you're needing? What is a boss asking you to produce at this meeting? Be prepared and be engaged in the meeting. I used to hate it when people would be staring at their cell phones or Blackberries in a meeting. Two things, one like either look like you were in, unengaged, then I would think about, well, maybe I'm not very engaging, right? So, but be engaged. Because when the, the team leader's looking out, he wants all of you to participate. You each have talents you to bring to the table, bring it. Be engaged with those folks. So in your first assignment as, or, or first uh, job as an engineer, Somebody's looking at you to see how talented and engaged and prepared you are. Being smart is not enough. I've got to be a good team player. And so when you show up, they want to keep people on the team who know his, that they, you share their opinion of importance for the project that needs, needs to be done. So if you don't look like you're interested, they're not very interested in you. And they'll find other people who are interested and they'll hire them. So be interested, be part of the team. And then aligned initiative. Aligned initiative is I'm not working to do this job to undermine the boss, to be self-serving, to move on to something else. You're part of the team. And if that comes out, you will erode the confidence in you from the rest of the team. They'll look at you and they'll question the integrity of your work if your initiative is not aligned. Say, so be a team player, that's your job. And the, your capacity to be a team player will lead into your ability to lead a team. You demonstrate the ability to be there, that guy gets it. That gal gets it. She's smart, sharp, engaged, great ideas, and thinking about this business that, I, that they're in. So I want them to lead a team and develop folks on this on other team, bringing people just like her into this team. So being a good leader starts with being a good follower, and then team building. Who are the right people? I've got to bring out those right people. Seek them out. People I know. Maybe you're in a hiring position. You've got to hire them in. All right? Who are the people in the organization that you've seen be on time, prepared, engaged, and their initiative is aligned? Bring those on my team because they'll get something done. You're going to build that team. You're going to resource them. What do they need to get their job done? And you're going to, you're going to motivate them. Ask for a little bit of magic out of that team. And mentorship. As you grow and you've experienced being a follower, and you've had good mentors and bad mentors, good examples and bad examples, they're all worthwhile for you. They all grow you individually. How do you mentor that person? Don't just rate someone, mentor them, lead them. So on a team, you have to mentor those folks. What do they need? What are they, uh, how do I grow? The best thing you can produce somebody on a team is another team leader just like you. Make your overall organization very powerful. Motivate them. And as you grow in your leadership skill, you develop and build a scan. What's going on? Some engineering projects take years, years. People want to develop, uh, in the Air Force, who develop new fighters, it's gonna take 30 years or something. So it's huge. That's more than a career for some officers. Things change. They change over time. Perhaps there's a new innovation out there that's changed what you're doing. You could speed things up or make what you're doing irrelevant. All right, your job is to scan. What resources do they need? What's new on the front? How can I, how can we st still stay relevant? And then developing judgment. 
when to take a risk and when not to. A quarterback's a good example of uh, uh, someone who's very good judgment. Good quarterbacks know when to make those, how to, how to make good plays. Who's open, who's not, well, reading the defense, understanding, looking at the wind, the, the point in the game where they're at, when the time to take risk. They know when to throw the ball long and take a risk at the Hail Mary. They know when to run the screen pass. They know when to hand it off. And they know sometimes to cover the ball and take a knee because it's worse to lose the ball. And they understand those things. And so there's a risk in what you do as well. How do I know when it's time to throw the long ball? How do I just keep grinding it out? And then look for that opportunity to throw the long ball or a weakness in the defense or an opportunity presents itself. Innovation, take advantage of it, okay? And finally, one of the most important skill sets of leaders is also communication. How do you talk to folks? How do you motivate them? Do you smile? Are you grumpy? Do you talk to people when they need it? Do you give them feedback? Do you communicate to them the vision and their place in the organization? Why it's important to have you as a young engineer? What motivates you to do what you want to do? Be part of the organization. Where is this company going? Why is it exciting for you? Communicating. So great leaders can communicate the vision of where you're, they're going. And down to the lowest level, they know how important it is for them to be on time, prepared, engaged, and their initiative aligned. They want to be part of this. They want to be so, so when something succeeds for the company, this vision is, uh, reveals itself, we did it. You own it. So a, business, a, a great leader is trying to create ownership down to the lowest level, buy-in from all of you in an organization. Okay, character. Character is what defines when, you, when things are going wrong, when the road is long and hard, when it looks like you're going to get a D plus maybe in abstract calculus and you might have to take it again, you know, all right, I'm going to keep at it. You are, your ability to define yourself as able to succeed and when you fail, failure doesn't define you. You have failed, but you, you are not a failure. And pick yourself up and go. So there's important areas under, under character. First thing is integrity. Our the military form, first core values for all the services, integrity first. If you have no integrity, then whatever you say is BS. It doesn't matter to anyone. No one's ever going to believe you. If you're Jekyll and Hyde in your social life, in what you, how you treat other people, no matter how good you say things, you might not say it, it's not true. And it brings into question everything you do, including your technical competence. If I can't trust you in small things and the very important things for which my entire company is hanging on, I'm not going to trust you. You scare me. A person without integrity is, 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 a, is a pariah to an organization. Discipline. We've got a whole slide in discipline coming up. At the core of discipline, someone to commit themselves willingly to the discipline required to develop their talent and to develop their character. Discipline. Sometimes it's a long, hard slog. Sometimes it's a personal look inside about what's keeping me from my goals. And sometimes the ability to keep get out of bed every morning despite being afraid of what tomorrow is going to bring. There's a, there's a level of discipline. And it sort of a dovetails into grit. Grit is perseverance, it's resilience, keep going again. There might be a time when you have a catastrophic semester because life happens. You've lost a relative, a close friend, you've run out of money, you're sick, and it's taking you off what you thought was going to be the four-year plan to get you into, into a job. Maybe it's a five-year plan now, or maybe it's something else. But people who have character, who have grit, they keep finding a way, and they don't let that failure or that obstacle define themselves, and they end up being succeeding because they have grit, perseverance, they're resilient. They know that they will succeed, and they know that while this might be a setback, they will keep moving towards their goal. Grit is, an, is a tremendous part of leadership character, okay? Now I'm moving to selflessness, and I'll give a shout out to a friend of mine, a uh, guy's name is uh, Colonel Bill DeMarco, he's working on some leadership analogies, and he has a hero leadership, and it was a, a concept that he was working on, and a lot of that defines that a hero is, is someone you probably want to think of as, as selflessness, right? They don't think of themselves before they act. 
They're going to go help somebody. No matter what the odds or the danger or hero will go. And they don't ponder the consequences of their actions. They ponder the consequences of not acting. And so Bill was, say, was looking, analyzed, analyzing these, these traits, and they think, that's selflessness. A hero is selflessness. So where, where are you at in terms of committing yourself to a team, to a risky activity? We asked military folks to be selfless quite a bit, to the ultimate level at some point. You see the only folks that earn the Medal of Honor, ultimate amount of selflessness. They lay their life down for other folks to live, for the campaign to succeed so that others may have freedom and not live a life of oppression under a despot, right? We want people to be selfless. A leader has to give of himself to the organization and take responsibility for all those actions that they're doing. They take responsibility for the decisions that they make, for the people they hire, okay? The only time a great leader is not gonna take responsibility is when the team succeeds. You did it. A great leader will say, you did it. I failed, you did it. It's a very common characteristic of great leaders. But take a responsibility for what's happened. Yesterday, the Secretary of the Air Force just announced that they were firing 10 commanders, the wing commander, the ops group commander, which is essentially right below him. These are people who command of thousands of people at a nuclear base because they had lieutenants who were cheating on emergency war orders exam. The exams are very difficult. But well, they're the heart of, you've got to know your business when the emergency order comes, comes in. You've got to decrypt that, figure out if you're going to launch your missiles or not. Okay, it's very important to get that right quick, first time. Okay, but people were, some people were cheating on that exam. Some of these commanders were not even aware that these folks were cheating. They had talked about core values. But in the end, the Secretary of the Air Force decided they had not done enough. Their scanning wasn't enough. They weren't digging in and asking questions, and she's fired 10 of them. Colonels, lieutenant colonels, majors lost their job. They took responsibility. And the commander, uh, Colonel Stanley, got up and he says, you know, my hand is on the wheel. I am responsible for when this happened. I didn't go out there and encourage cheating. In fact, I talked about the core values of integrity and not doing this. But you know what? My hands are on the wheel when the ship went down. You're responsible. But you know what? I'll bet he's got grit. And despite this, what is a, one of the largest failures probably in his time, I'll bet that individual's got grit. And that will define that individual's future success from a very, very difficult problem. Okay. Confidence and courage. And decisiveness, I would tell you. These things are also related to competence. Because the better you are, the more, the more you know your business, the more confidence you are in making decisions, right? So the more confident you are, that helps you make confident decisions. It also helps you be courageous at the right time because if you know the business, you know, you know, engineering is about close assumptions a lot. Frequently, I, right, so I want to get about that. You understand the, the physics of it all, the chemistry of it all, all right? What's a good hypothesis? Where were we at? You can make a guess. And you get closer and closer to understanding a large body of information so that when you decide to make a decision that seems courageous to other people, but for you, you've experienced a lot and you know a lot. And so confidence drives some of your character. And then there's also making the calculated risk. That's courageous. So confidence drives some of your character development. So the more you learn about your job and yourself and your industry, what's going on, the more confident you can be. So it isn't that it stands alone, you can develop that, okay? And courageous, you might seem courageous to someone who doesn't really understand the career field very well. So it might to you not seem courageous at all. Other people that, wow, pretty courageous, but you knew because you're very confident your skill set. And then being decisive, because ultimately, as a leader, you're, you're paid to decide. The team's gonna come to you and say, well, boss, you gotta decide. That's where responsibility comes in. That's where competence comes in. You have to decide. Okay, ultimately it's you have to make the decision the team's gonna move forward. So make a decision and move out. And don't look back. Learn from your mistake to a mistake. Let the team enjoy success. Passionate enthusiasm. You can see I'm, I'm passionate about leadership. I have some enthusiasm to talk about it. What drives you? 
I'll bet if you were to say to yourself, what really motivates me? I hope engineering somewhere in there. For me, it was space operations. And so when I tried to find, do something inside my passion, I couldn't be an astronaut, right? But I could be an engineer. So it was kind of cool because, you know, I, I learned a lot about physics and whatnot, so I would decide if an alien race ever showed up here on the Earth, that I'd be the guy I'd go, before you shoot us the death ray, how did you get here? Can I have a peek at that propulsion system? Because I understand, you know, as far as I know, you can't go back to the speed of light. And that's a long way. So how did you get here? Maybe there's something I don't know. I'm really curious about that. That's the engineer in me, right? So it marries my space ops and my inner geekdom and all those kinds of stuff. So when I see all the shows, I go, where'd that guy come from? And they make up some kind of thing that, you know, well, it's time travel and black holes and stuff. And I, you know, okay, I don't really understand that. You know, there's some folks out there working on some theories like that. And I'm really excited. Perhaps they'll figure that out. Because make those big leaps in engineering. But I'm, that's kind of the inner geek in me. My passion is in those things. And engineering sort of fulfills that passion for me. Um, I'm still, I've been a member of AIAA since 1983. Okay, I read the books and everything comes up. You know, I used to do computational fluid dynamics on 477 with cards, right? That's what I did CFD on, right? Um, so the, I, I can remember all those things, and now the things they do with CFD on computers is amazing. Um, it just, it, the, what's out there, to leap forward, to be passionate about, be part of that, you know, what, where is that at? And be enthusiastic. There's an element of passion that I want to caution against, and that's intemperance. So to be a good leader, you need to have exercise temperance. I used to golf with a guy. And we were pretty good golfers. And when he'd miss a shot, he'd get grumpy. And at some point, things wouldn't be going his way, and he'd throw his club. And he'd curse. And then maybe he'd run up against the group in front of us on one of the holes, and, and he'd, he'd be cussing them out. He might even hit into them with the ball, you know. Uh, and angered folks on the, on, the, on, the, on the course. We get back, you go get the marshal, when he chew out the marshal, you're not doing your job, I paid my money, and you're not moving these people along, and you know, it turns out the people in front of us were World War II vets that did, one of, one of the guys were missing legs, and they're a little bit slow. So his anger is out of a belief that the people in front of him were bad. It's not from a position of knowledge. Passion comes out of knowledge. Emotion is out of belief about someone. So when you're angry and you're kicking stuff around, pretty soon our foursome, well, those some of the guys had other things to do. They didn't want to hang around this guy because guess what? Soul sucking. It was just, I didn't want to be with this person. They could go off with me, but eventually no one wanted to play with them. And the course didn't want them there either. And you could tell me, Todd, you have no passion. No, I'm just not an ass, right? So there's that piece of that. Be careful of being intemperate. Being intemperate drives people away. Okay. Don't mistake kicking around things and being loud and being angry is your passion. That might come out occasionally. I hope it's in your office behind a closed door all by yourself and you're punching a pillow. But when you open that door, passion and enthusiasm about the job. Move out. Okay? So don't be, don't be intemperate. Be temperate. Temperance is an important part of your character. Discipline. So we're going to rock through these real quick uh, on discipline. This is a piece of like leadership. So I'm going to talk about health and growth. Your health and your growth. Physical discipline. Do I work out? Do I remain healthy? I can guarantee you if you're obese, you've got diabetes, you've got lung cancer because you smoked all your life, None of your inner passion to get things done, that's going to consume everything. Survival is going to consume everything for you. Those of you who have taken some classes in, you know, over the liberal arts side, you have Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? You're in the survival mode. You can't be effective if you're fighting to live. Take care of yourself. Understand what goes in your body. And then start small. Develop the discipline to go out and take care of your body. Because when you're 50, 60, 70 years old, how do you want to be? You've developed a lot of leadership experience and a lot of talent, but if you're, you can't get there, you're living on an oxygen machine because you haven't taken care of your body throughout your whole life, it's difficult to be that person. So take care of yourself. Drink water. Water for this brain food. Drink water all the time. Okay? 
A dehydrated brain loses its, its reasoning capacity and its learning capacity. Drink water. They try to avoid the energy drinks and whatnot, I know. So hydrate yourself somehow, okay? All right, smart mind. Emotionally, how do I take care of myself? Who's my friends? Can I, can I go grab a beer with friends and enjoy myself? Do I have an outlet? In the Air Force, we call those wingmen, all right? Somebody be around you, be around those folks. When things go bad, I can go have a beer or a drink or a soda, do yoga, whatever, whatever, you, do, whatever you do that calms you and gives you some inner peace. Are you, do you have a spiritual background? Maybe you have that d delivers you some inner calm to take care of you when things are bad. Take care of your mind. Take care of your body. Take care of your mind. Do something random, fun, exhilarating, outside the norm for you. Grow your brain. Physical development, okay? We already talked about this quite a bit. Develop your skill, whether it's an athletic skill, a motor skill, golf skill, skiing, or engineering, computing programming, you know, um, thinking up new ideas. The human brain is amazing, okay? Develop yourself. Mentally, read. I don't want to miss that new thing that comes out in the aerospace or the space field. I read all the time when I find out what's going on. And occasionally I read about some, some ideas that sound wacky that I hope work out true. You know, do some critical thought. When somebody presents something to you, you go, that doesn't sound right. And ask some questions. Do some critical thought about some things. Develop your ability to make good decisions. Okay, social. This I'm talking to kids all the time. You cannot be someone else on Facebook that you are a real person. When people see all your stuff on Facebook, they're going to make a value judgment about you. Understand what's out there. Be timely what's, what's out in social media. Pay attention to that. Again, it goes back to the integrity of people. All right? If you're a nut job on Facebook and you're a troll and you make evil comments, right? <laughs> you're not the person they see in the office and that stuff gets out and it's forever. So check yourself, watch what you're doing, avoid that, okay? Make sure that you can own the comments that are up there and you can say those to your mother, all right? <laughs> this is a comment by Oprah Winfrey. Character and competence are developed over time, provides you that luck when it occurs because you are ready to seize an opportunity because you developed yourself and your ability to do what you do and work a team, make money. Continuous improvement, always, always throughout your whole life, for you and your organization. And then build sustainable excellence in an organization, a flash in the pan, and you're gone. But you want to build an organization, when that new idea comes along, what are you about? Look at Apple, right? They developed some initial improvements, but they weren't about the, the early Mac. They were about design and excellence and innovation. And they developed a lot of new tools. They developed sustainable excellence continuous improvement over time. They had to hire the right people, bring those new ideas in, but their company was not about the product. They're about why they do things. To produce outstanding, beautiful products that people love to use that are easy to use. It's a cycle. Be ready for change. If things happen, what's going on, right? So do you get that? Let me think about that a second. Escalator, okay, yeah. let's walk up the escalator. Things have changed, right? All right. Manage change, scanning, looking for things. Look out for risk. Where's the fruit on the tree? At the end of the limb. Sometimes to get that, you gotta make that risk, all right? Production. This is Leonardo da Vinci. People make things happen. No entropy. That's your engineering joke, right? So, all right? Make things happen. Put things together. Make things the more that they're what they're, what they're or not otherwise going to be is in disarray. Build value into your life for other people, for the things that you do. Build that in. Be productive. And finally, the power is with you. The greatest power that people give up is believing that, that they don't have the power to do it. You've got to believe in yourself, that you have the discipline to do these things. You have the ability to do these things. You are resilient to problems and change. Okay, and you will find your goal. And it might not be what you thought about today. I didn't think I'd be here 27 years ago. I thought I'd be working rockets and doing other things. And new things interest me. My passion was lit and I moved forward. Okay? So sometimes you have to let go of the past, let your passion develop, 
and it's wonderful in front of you. At the core, you believe that you have power. Don't give that to anyone else. Take charge of yourself and take charge of your life. Thank you very much. I'll take questions. So I get the first question. OK. You talked about continuous learning. You talked about failure, but about learning from that. Right. You talked about you're going to retire soon. Yes. Right. So a few years ago, you were here. Right. Based upon your last 27, 28 years, what's the one thing you wish you would have known or maybe did different when you were sitting here? Hmm. I think uh, opportunity. You know, I, I didn't really kind of know how things were going to pan out over time. Uh, and it sort of, I was pretty narrowly focused on being engineering. And I want to understand that, you know, I was going to have to lead, lead people. And so uh, RTC in our classes helped you develop some leadership skills and demonstrate it. But um, being open to opportunity, um, taking a risk to jump to something new and, and ride that uh, and, and develop some personal fulfillment. Um, I, I find myself pretty lucky that I got into a business that I, I enjoyed doing. Um, and I, while I started as an engineer for the Air Force, I grew into leadership positions of leading people. And then I, I led uh, air operations as a vice commander for an air operations center. So I ran like a, um, a, a big cycle. We planned air power and strikes. And so that was way outside of my comfort zone. Um, but it was a lot about leadership at that point. In my last job, I was the, um, a support group commander for Yokota Air Base in Japan during the um, tsunami, earthquake, nuclear disaster. And I found myself leading people. And I really enjoyed, all of a sudden, leading people to that crisis. And also, I sort of enjoyed leading the city, right? being around in power plants and, and uh, road and civil engineering, because it, it fed my inner geek, right? I still like doing all that stuff. But it had a lot of diversity and a lot of challenges. And so I really liked the fact that there were areas. So I think open yourself to the possibilities. Be really, at this point, you, know, you are going to be a engineer, develop some competence, and then blossom from that, those roots. And those will lead you down excellent paths. So, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Colonel Felice for two things. One, for obviously coming today and sharing his story. And second, doing something that a lot of us don't do and serve our country in a very unique way. Very well. Thank you.